Like most schools, my high school used to have this extracurricular program that we used to call Outdoor Adventure. Outdoor Adventure consisted of a group of students and a few teachers who would get together after school once a week to go for short hikes in the area. And towards the end of the season, we would all go on a weekend camping trip, which was hands down the best part of the whole group. We would get our permission slips early in the year so we would know exactly where we were going that season, which kind of gave all of us something to look forward to during the stressful times of the year. In 2015, we ended up going to this rather small campground that was in the mountains near the Delaware River. It was such a quiet and scenic place. There was nothing like it. The first day was amazing. We all got situated and familiar with our surroundings, and then we went on a few walks. But day two, which was a Saturday, was the one that everyone was anticipating to be the best of the whole trip. We were going kayaking down a stretch of the Delaware, and we had all been looking forward to it since we saw it on the schedule. The final day came, and we all made our way to the two vans that were taking us to the two spots where we would park. We parked one van where we planned on ending our trip down the river, and then all piled into the other and drove upstream. After we got to the small bank on the river where we had planned to set off, we all began inflating our kayaks and getting into the water. And in no time, we were off. Now we had been warned that since it had been a rainy season, some parts of the river might be moving a bit faster than usual. But it was nothing that we shouldn't have been able to handle. Plus, we had multiple experienced chaperones with us in case something bad did happen. So none of us expected anything bad to go wrong. But I guess that sometimes when everything goes wrong. I was in the back of the line of kayaks as we made our way down the river. The only person behind me was one of our teachers, Mr. Flint, who ended up stopping to use the bathroom in the woods and said he would catch up. One of the chaperones in the front of the line began passing back the message from one student to the next that we were going to be hitting some minor rapids, but to be ready for them. In no time, I could start to hear the sound of running water turn into more of a rushing sound. I wasn't concerned though. It really wasn't going too fast. It just didn't feel like a lazy river anymore. That was when things went from fun to horrifying. Out of nowhere, I felt a slam in the bottom of my kayak as it must have hit a rock. And before I could react in any way, it was flipping to the side. I was under the water, but still inside the kayak that was still drifting quickly downstream. I did everything I could to free myself from the inflatable vessel, and just as I broke loose, my back was slammed against a rock. I began tumbling around in the current, and I had no idea where my kayak was at that point. I tried to find my center. But when you're being pulled by water and bouncing between rocks in murky water, it's near impossible. I could hardly tell which way was up, let alone move in that direction. I was at the mercy of the river, and I don't think I was going to make it out had it not been for Mr. Flint. At first, I thought a paddle from the kayak had hit me in the chest, but to my luck, it was Mr. Flint's arm grabbing onto my shirt and pulling me above the surface. It was a highly stressful moment, but he did his best to get us to the end of the rushing water as fast as he could. And once he did, we both loaded into his kayak and caught up with the rest of the class. Every holiday season, the town next to ours hosted a county event that was called the Winter Wonderland. It was a small festival that would be held in the center of a small town in upstate New York, and it was mostly just baked goods being sold by vendors, while local talents and artists would perform. It was usually a lot of fun, and almost every elementary school district in the county would go during the day and see Santa and all that fun stuff. That year was just like any other. 
It was so much fun at the actual winter wonderland. The hot chocolate was delicious. The people working as Santa's elves were very charismatic. It was great. The bus ride home was a different story though. As you might know, around December in New York, it gets dark pretty early. And this was a field trip where our parents had to pick us up at the school afterwards because it would have been too late to catch a bus home. So we left the winter wonderland around four in the afternoon. So it was already getting dark and right before we left, it started to snow. This was nothing new though. It snowed all of the time so none of us kids were worried. I'm sure the bus driver was doing his best, but sometimes accidents happen. As we were making our way down a hill that had a small bend towards the bottom, we all felt the bus shake a bit. And as we got closer to the bend in the road, the bus wasn't turning. The bus driver told everyone to hang on tight and before we knew it, we were flying over the side of the hill. The bus tires tore through the freshly powdered snow on the ground as we barreled toward the trees ahead of us at what felt like light speed, but was probably like 20 miles an hour. I'll never forget the image of a bunch of my classmates scrambling to their seats, trying to get our seatbelts on, but most of us weren't fast enough. Most of my classmates ended up with just a few bumps and bruises. As for me and two other students, we went flying. You see, I was in an aisle walking around even though the teachers told me not to. And when the bus lost traction, I couldn't make it to a seat in time. I was facing the back of the bus when it made an impact with the trees ahead of us. All I remember is being ripped backward off of my feet from the force. And then I woke up in a hospital bed four days later. When the bus hit the tree line, I, along with two other students, were launched through the front windshield of the bus. One of them, ended up being just fine somehow. All she needed was a few stitches. I apparently went head first into a tree and had to be placed into a medically induced coma for a few days while doctors worked on my skull. As for our other classmate, he didn't make it out of the ambulance. He was the first of us to go through the windshield and I believe the impact of the glass plus the impact of the frozen ground caused too much damage, both internal and external. Our school district never attended winter events that required buses again. In fifth grade, our school took us on a field trip to a science museum, and it's one that I don't think I'll ever be able to forget. The more I think back on that day, the more I realize how dangerous the situation was for all of us who were there. You see, since the museum was a big place, each class was split into multiple groups, each with a different chaperone. My group consisted of me, my friends James and Peter, and we also had a new girl in our class named Elisa who was with us. One of my biggest regrets from that day was not paying more attention to Elisa. But as a kid, the only thing I was paying attention to was all the shiny things at the museum and making dumb jokes with my friends. What everyone had failed to notice was that our class had picked up one extra person who was tagging along with us. Most of us just assumed that it was one of the other students' parents that were there to chaperone. So none of us really thought twice about an extra adult, especially since he had been following us around to all the exhibits and interacting with us and our chaperones as if he belonged there. He was giving us all sorts of lessons about what certain exhibits were all about and everything seemed normal. That all changed about 20 minutes before we all expected to load back onto the buses and head back to the school. It was at the time that Peter's mother, the woman who was our group's chaperone, noticed that Elisa was no longer with our group. She tried her best to keep calm about the situation, and she let other chaperones and the teachers know what was going on. And soon enough, security and museum staff were looking all over the place for Elisa, but after searching for about an hour, there was no sign of her. That was when the police got involved, 
and they ended up looking at the security footage of the museum that day. It turns out that that charismatic man that we thought was a chaperone was someone who followed our class into the museum that day. The footage from the camera showed the man kneeling down and talking to Elisa before the two both made their way outside into the parking lot. It was there that she seemed to get into the man's car on her own without being forced. The police believe that he lied about something to make Elisa believe that he was taking her back to the school or home or something of that nature. There was no sign of the man's car or Elisa for a few weeks, but then word began to spread quickly around the town that police had found her body off a small trail in the woods, off a side road just 15 minutes away from the museum. Not too many details were made public about the state of the body, only that she had been brutally beaten before her death. The school was in trouble for not keeping a closer eye on their students during the trip, and the entire grade was shaken up about what happened. None of us really gotten to know Elisa, but we all wish we had.